Hi everyone! In this video we're going to learn how to solve a linear first-order differential equation. And you're looking at its general form. Let's try to understand what's written here. First of all, it's the first-order differential equation because the highest derivative is the first derivative, dy dx. Now let's refresh what it means for an equation to be a linear differential equation. Well, there are two conditions that have to be satisfied. The first one is that y, dependent variable, and all its derivatives should be raised to the first power. As we can see here, y itself is raised to the first power, and derivative of dy dx is raised to the first power. I made a note of that. And the second condition is that all coefficients should be functions of x, the independent variable. Well, let's look at the coefficients and the way they are presented here. Now, the coefficients in a differential equation is everything that's written in front of y and all its derivatives. So, in front of the first derivative, we can see a1 of x, well, it's just the function notation, emphasizing that it's a function of x. And in front of y, we have a sub 0 of x, again, it's a function of x. I made a note of that. And now, this is what makes a differential equation a linear differential equation linear differential equation. But when we try to solve a linear first-order differential equation, we actually want to put it in a different form. So what we're going to do, we're going to modify this general form this way. We're going to start by dividing every term by the leading coefficient by a1 of x. I copied the equation here so that I can perform those steps. So what I do, as I said, um, I am dividing every term by the leading coefficient, a sub 1 of x. Of course, it gets cancelled. So now there is nothing in front of dy dx. And what we're going to do next, we're going to rename um, what we have now in front of y and on the right-hand side. So everything that's in front of y the current coefficient of y. We're going to call p of x. Well, it's a function, right? Because a sub 0 of x is a function, a sub 1 of x is the function. When we divide two functions, we get a function. So we're going to call that function uppercase p of x. And the right-hand side function, g of x over a sub 1 of x, we're just going to call f of x. So that is f of x. And with that, we're going to obtain a new form, or um, I should say a more useful form of a linear equation. It's called standard form. This is how it's going to look. So dy dx plus p of x y equals f of x. That is standard form. And now we're going to do an example in which I'll show you how to solve a linear differential equation and we'll see how we refer to certain parts of this equation in standard form. Here's an example we're going to do. Um, we need to find the general solution of the given differential equation and we also need to state an interval on which the general solution is defined. So I'll explain how this is all done. And here is the equation. Now it's a linear equation. Real quick, we can check that y and its derivative are to the first power. And coefficients are the functions of x. Well, x itself, and then this is just a constant. So to solve a linear equation, we need to follow a certain procedure. I'll show you how to do it step by step. Now, I'm not going to be providing a proof of that procedure, but you can definitely find it in your textbook. So let me show you what step one is. So in step one, we need to put this equation in standard form. And if you remember, the standard form is dy dx plus p of x y equals f of x. So basically, the standard form does not have a leading coefficient, right? So if we look at our equation, to obtain the standard form, we need to get rid of x in the front. And we do that by dividing by x every single term of the equation. Like that. Don't forget to divide on the right-hand side as well. So this is what I have now. dy dx 
plus a function in front of y becomes 2 over x. I'm going to write like that. 2 over x, so it's more obvious, y equals, and then on the right-hand side is 3 over x. So that's step one. In step two, we first need to identify p of x. Well, as we said, it's whatever is in front of y when the equation is in standard form. So p of x is here. This is p of x. So identify p of x, and then we're going to find the integrating factor. So let me write this down and explain how it's found. So the integrating factor is just a spe special expression that has the following form. It's always going to be e raised to the power that is integral of p of x, p of x dx. So integral of function p of x is the power of e. So that's what the integrating factor is. And we're going to find it in a second, but I just want to give you the heads up um, about what we're going to do with that. Well, it's called integrating factor. Remember when we hear factor, we think of multiplication operation, right? So in the next step, what we'll do once we find the integrating factor, we're going to multiply every single term of our equation by that factor, and that will do some magic, so you'll see. Now let's find the integrating factor. So every time I'm going to write the following. It's going to be e, and then I'm going to set up integral that's in the power, and what I put in the, in, inside the integral is function p of x. So in my case, function p of x is 2 over x dx. And then, of course, I have to simplify that by, well, integrating um, the function in the power. You might want to do it on the side if integration involves a number of steps, but in, if integration is somewhat easy, then you just go ahead and do it here. So in our case, integration is easy, right? Because, well, first of all, I can put 2 outside of the integral. This will help me to see what I have there. Then it's going to be 1 over, over x dx, and we know that antiderivative of 1 over x is ln, ln of x, or I should say ln of the absolute value of x. And we're not writing plus c here. So at this point, we want to try to simplify if we can. And um, for this particular example, first of all, what I'll do is the following. I'm going to drop the absolute value. I don't want to drag it with me. However, if I drop the absolute value, I have to make a note. So I'll just write 2 ln of x. And when I drop the absolute value like that, I have to make a note that x has to be greater than 0 to satisfy the domain of logarithmic function. Now, we can actually simplify it further. And since this is somewhat common station, I want to remind you um, where the simplification comes from. It comes from the properties of logarithms. Remember, and that's something you learned in algebra, we have the following property for logarithms. If there is something that's raised to the power that is logarithm of, let's say, b with base a, so when that something that you're raising to the power is exactly the same as the base of logarithm, right? Then it just simplifies to a b in this case. So we can drop logarithm, we can drop this base to which, which we raise to the power, so that's simply b. And as we look at our example, well, we have a similar situation, right? We have e that's being raised to the power that involves logarithm. What's well, the natural logarithm? So its base is e, right? So we should be able to pull off this property. The only thing that, according to this property, there shouldn't be anything in the front of the logarithm. And we have 2 in the front. So somehow we need to get rid of it or put it somewhere else. Well, at this point, you might also remember another property of logarithms that coefficients in front of logarithms can be put inside and they turn into a power of whatever stands in the logarithm. So long story short, um, what I want to do is to rewrite it this way. That becomes e to the power ln of x to the second power, like that. So that's where 2 
um, is right now. And now we can apply this property that I have in the box. So basically what we're left with is x squared, right? We drop ln, we drop e, we just have x squared. Okay, so remember now what we're doing here. We're doing step two, well, where we need to find the integrating factor. Well, these are the steps for finding the integrating factor and for all the simplification and integration, that's what we ended up with. So now next is step three. In step three, as I already said, uh, we're gonna multiply each term of the equation by the integrating factor. So let's try that. So I wrote down the step and I copied down the equation itself, right? That's, that's our equation here. And now I'll perform the step. So I'm taking every single term and multiplying it by x squared. That is our integrating factor times x squared. Don't forget the right hand side. And that's pretty much all we do in this step. The only thing that I can see how I can simplify a um, couple terms here, right? So here that square cancels, x goes away, square cancels, x goes away. So I have x squared dy dx plus 2xy equals 3x, like that. Okay, that's step three. Now, step four. In step four, we're going to rewrite the left-hand side because it's actually representing something special. Let me show what it is. So here's step four. We write the left side of the equation as, and that is the expression, dy dx, and then uh, in the brackets we have e with the power, do you recognize this, times y. Okay, so what do we have here? It looks like it's the product of the integrating factor times y. Now, why should we do that or why can't we do that? Well, let's first write this down and then we'll, you know, take a closer look at what, what it actually ends up being. So I'll just follow this. I need to say d dx, so that is derivative, right? Derivative of this integrating factor, well, in my case, integrating factor is x squared times y, well, just y next to it. So that is the left-hand side. Why do I write this way? Well, let's think about it. So here is again derivative of x squared and y. So it's the derivative of the product. Well, let's think of, well, take derivative of a product. Remember, well, we have to follow product rule. Well, let's try to apply it, just, you know, talk through the product rule in our heads. So I can say the following. According to the product rule, I need to take the first factor and multiply it by the derivative of the second factor, right? So look at our uh, previous step first factor x squared and then derivative dy dx of the second factor. We got that. And then remember, according to the product rule, then we have to add, well, here's the plus, derivative of the first factor. What is derivative of x squared? Well, it's 2x times the second factor, y, 2xy. So that's derivative of the first factor times the second factor. So yeah, we can totally write it this way because as we can see here, we do have a derivative right here um, of the product of the integrating factor and y. And that's what you're always gonna get as you follow all the steps, as you find the integrating factor correctly. This always should work out this way. So when you write step four, make sure that you double check that once you apply product rule, you go back to this left-hand side. And then the right-hand side stay, stays as it is, so 3x. So that's how our equation looks like now. And why we need this step? Well, because the last step of the of the of this process will be to integrate both sides. So I can already make some notes here, and then I will write down the step itself in a minute. Um, it's going to say integrate both sides. So as I integrate the left hand side, well, and then I will have to integrate the right hand side. But what happens on the left when we take integral? of antiderivative, remember they cancel each other out, these are reverse operations, integration and differentiation. So basically writing the left-hand side in this form helps us to integrate the left-hand side in a second. So step five, integrate both sides of the equation. I already 
kind of show that, right? How am I integrating both sides? On the left, this goes away and I'm left with just x squared y. And the right hand side, well, I do have to perform integration on the right hand side. In this case, it's very simple, so I can just do it right away. If it's more complicated, you can always write it on the side, right? That's your scratch work. So in this case, antiderivative of 3x is just 3x squared over 2 plus c. And this is our solution. So that is the function, or I should say family of functions, because of the arbitrary constant, that satisfies the given linear first order differential equation. And in fact, by following those five steps, it's always going to be pretty easy to put this um, function in the explicit form, in other words, to get y by itself. Now, this is usually an optional step. But if I decide to get y by itself to obtain explicit form, um, it will be easy because I can just divide by x squared every term of this function. And I'll get the following. So those to cancel, those to cancel, and I have now the following explicit form y equals, uh, now it's 3 over 2 plus c over x squared, like that. So that is the function, or I should say family of functions, that satisfy the given equation. And um, if, if you remember, one of the questions or part of the question was to state an interval in which the general solution is defined. And as we solve that equation, remember how we put one restriction when we drop the absolute value around x, so that x has to be positive. So that's going to be the restriction that we're going to have to keep. So I'll put it here. x has to be greater than zero. Um, I can leave it in this form or, or I can write it um, as a double inequality x is between 0 and infinity, like that. Same thing, 